Podcast. Uh, I'm Mike Deshier. I got Adam and Polly here with me uh, this week. Also, our guest this week is uh, Donnie Bingham. Uh, Donnie, I know that there's a lot to say as far as your background and stuff like that. And like I mentioned before, I don't want to really mess it up. So I'm going to turn it over to you and let you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, so, yeah, so I don't mess it up. Well, I appreciate it, Mike. It's just definitely an honor to get an opportunity to speak with y'all, uh, gentlemen. All uh, a lot of respect for all three of you. Uh, just to touch base a little bit without getting too much in depth. Uh, I joined the military back in '91, so I got a little over 22 years of experience in the military. I was a former Marine, started out in the Marines, and then transitioned over to the Army after I completed my degree in exercise science. Uh, and I also have a master's degree in uh, the exercise science community too. Um, my current position right now is a uh, strength coach for the U.S. Army Physical Fitness School. There's only one physical fitness school in the military, period, out of all four branches. Uh, and I did have the luxury with my timeline that it fit in for, you know, a little old four to be able to slide in and maybe do this position on my last few years before I retire from the Army. Um, again, as a strength coach here, my primary focus is uh, obviously to set the conditions for the tactical athlete to be able to move under a load because anybody knows anything about soldiers now, they, they carry 115 pounds, uh, which is three times the amount of weight that, you know, a World War II soldier carried on the ground. And, and my background is infantry, uh, airborne and ranger, and uh, like I said, Marine. So I'm very comfortable uh, kind of moving out in space a little bit. I have about uh, six deployments under my belt. So I've got a little over of, uh, 60 months plus in combat uh, on my, on my Cadillacs. Um, so from going from that perspective, you probably say, well, what brings me into powerlifting? Um, I kind of started that back in 92, uh, in the Marines. I don't know if y'all know a gentleman by the name of Sly Anderson, uh, that was a world champion, uh, Marine. Uh, and, uh, you can definitely pull up some of his stuff. I was really impressed when he took 150 pounds and put it on his uh, waist and commenced to do 10 pull-ups, two standard with it on his waist. I definitely had a new profound uh, aspect about what strength training has to do. Yeah, I can understand that. I was mackerel. <laughs> but you're a competitive powerlifter yourself too, right? So we just uh, competed at, at Raw Nationals in uh, Scranton. Well, that's about a month ago now. That's um, correct. How'd that go? It, it uh, went pretty well for me, considering I was coming off a dislocated knee injury. Um, I did, you know, take the world championship in the 93s uh, in Finland. Um, did pretty well there. One of my best uh, meet performances. It's always good to do that on the IPF stage. Um, but, no, I, I was able to retain my seat uh, for Team USA next year uh, in the 83 class. Uh, but, again, my numbers were a little bit down, about 100, 150 pounds. Well, I mean, I'm no injury specialist, but I'm pretty sure it's okay to me. pretty serious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that sounds uh, uh, sounds pretty awesome, actually, to, to come back and do what you did. And, and first of all, having come off the Finland competition, which we've talked about in the past, um, is a better turnaround this year with Nationals being in October. But um, still, for a lot of guys, it's uh, not always an easy transition uh, to – you know, have all these multiple peak performances and stuff like that. But uh, it sounds like you came off of that meet real well and uh, planning to go to Texas uh, next summer. So that's pretty awesome. Um, Most definitely. I'm excited about it, uh, considering, you know, I told you I started back in the early 90s. Right. Competed for about six or eight years and then um, took a furlough. I had, I had some boys, you know, I was married and all the deployments. Um, obviously continued to do strength training continue to stay up on uh, the things that's out there in the National Strength Con Conditioning Association. I'm a re I've been a professional member with them over 10 years. Um, so I kept up with that and maintained my strength as much as possible. But it was 2013 when I come back on the, on the scene. Okay, great. So just as more formality than anything else, uh, for people who uh, maybe don't put, uh, don't put a lot of stock into the the national and the world uh, titles that you got behind you. Do you want to? Do you feel like sharing what your uh, best competition lifts are? Yes, my best uh, squat is 270, so 596 pounds. 
Uh, my best bench is uh, 363, and then my best deadlift is uh, 622. And my body weight was about 185. There you go, right? So for anybody who maybe doesn't, uh, doesn't put a whole lot into titles, maybe you should. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I was talking with Adam, uh, gosh, maybe a week ago, maybe a little bit more than that. And first of all, he came down to to see the place that you've got uh, going on uh, with the, uh, uh, I guess, the facility that you're that you're operating there. And he came away totally blown away, super impressed by the whole thing, the whole experience of it. And, and I guess that he got a bit of time to sit down and chat with you. And he's telling me like, Mike, you got to talk to Donnie about. Uh, about auto regulation and talk to him about how they're implementing, you know, auto regulation with, uh, with the soldiers there. Um, what can you share with us about what you guys uh, have going on in that way? Well, I tell you, Mike, just like you, uh, from your perspective on, uh, auto regulation, you know, it, it started back in the seventies, uh, and I can reflect back in, you know, college and remember the Carl board model was a model that, you know, ties into endurance athletes that runs on a 15 point scale. Um, so that's something that I've always kind of toyed with, uh, and, and that ability to be able to find night and allow my program to continue to adjust based on my fatigue level or based on my particular aspect of that training that day really allows me to set the conditions, I believe, to continuously to adjust the stimuli so that your body don't acclimate to that stimuli. So definitely, I base mine on a five-point scale. Um, I don't really do anything below a six, and I, I, I ended at a 10. Um, I pretty much promote for the soldier to focus on, you know, the seven and eight range uh, to allow us to have the ability to be better tactical athletes. Try not to touch the nine and tens too often. Again, because it's unfortunate, we don't have a lot of smart people out there that's educated. So what we do is we put ourselves in overtraining too quick, and we end up putting ourselves out of the fight. Uh, essentially, at the end of the day, so guys are basically willing to work themselves to death on on training, and uh, you're more or less providing some tools for them to kind of rein it in a little bit, right? That's correct, and I use it on every aspect, Mike. Uh, I don't care if they're doing plyometrics. You know, I'm going to use an, an RP scale. I don't care if they're going to go on a run. You know, a foot march. You know, some type of tactical event. Uh, I try to allow them to utilize heart rate when it comes to the other pieces, and then I allow it to be based on essentially what type of weight they're moving uh, for the other RPEs. That makes sense to me. So you're really incorporating it in the in the broader sense, and and I I agree with that too. By the way, it's uh, it, like effort is kind of one of these fundamental components that's a lot of times not included in in how we think about training. You know, like there's that's there's reps, distance, load, and all this other, all these other factors. But um, how hard is the athlete uh, working? Basically, you know, I, I don't, I hesitate to say how hard are they pushing because, like, if we're talking about traditional power lifts, they were talking about bench pressing. I still want my lifters to, to push as hard as they can, but it's more of like a performance metric, you know, like push definitely. Yeah. That is a missing gap, and uh, I noticed, you know, you're taking significant strides uh, with your organization and moving in the right direction, uh, and I'm definitely on board exactly with what you're driving, and it's my goal, you know, to, to train 4,000-plus soldiers a year that are leaders uh, as a master fitness trainer so they can have a basic understanding of understanding that effort and understanding what they're exerting and maybe allow that soldier again to be able to come back tomorrow and have another efficient training session, I think it's a win-win. Uh, it's just unfortunate we have too many muscular skeletal injuries, and I think a lot of it loops back to the fact that everything's a competition. Uh, we can't go as hard as we can on every workout. Right, right. Yeah, you gotta got to have time to train and not just, not just kind of pushing it to the limit the, the whole time, right? Most definitely. And the good thing is I do have a pretty good uh, flexible budget here, uh, being that we're the only school in the Army and uh, we got a big picture of oversight. So I'm able to bring in a piece of equipment like the gym aware, you know, and I get I get gentlemen sometimes to show up what we call the gray beards, you know, the two and three star general generals that, you know, think, oh, wow, this is very expensive. How are we, you know, purchasing these items? But it definitely allows us to finite the training to allow them to really get feedback immediately. Yeah. 
Yeah. So is that how you're you're using the gym aware? Are you basically teaching RPE and teaching the subjective component using that tool? That's part of it. Uh, it does give them at least a, a snapshot because you know well as I do in the 21st century, people learn with you know application and they learn by being able to see and touch something. Uh, so for me to take a tether and attach it to a bar and be able to allude to some different data points and show them the difference of how the bar speed moves based on fatigue and effort, it really sticks home, I think, the point that they need to see right here in our schoolhouse because when they get back out to their operating unit, they're not going to probably have that capability right there. But they do be able to have the understanding of that soldier, you know, while under load, cannot do that many repetitions. If they do, they're going to be an overtraining. Yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of how I use it in, in my own training. Now, of course, it's different application between, you know, training soldiers and uh, training powerlifters, but it's similar, similar end game, I guess, right? So, oh, definitely. Yeah, the, the way I the way I use it, um, I'm tracking bar speed, and if I know how slow uh, a maximal lift is, uh, basically, how how slow can you go, kind of. Um, like I said, you're always pushing as fast as you can, but a heavy weight is going to move slower. And oh, yeah. some lifters can grind out a heavy weight and some just can't. Like it's either fast or not at all. Um, so if you know kind of where you fall on that scale, how much does a max effort lift, like how fast does a max effort lift move? Uh, and then you compare your training lifts to that. You know about how hard you're working. And it's not perfect, but it's a good way to kind of get a feel for it. Um, and kind of to that end, you know, I've talked to, to Matt Gary in the past about, and, and all, all you guys about, uh, do I feel like it would make any difference to my training uh, if I had never had a Tendo or a Gym Aware or any of that, if I'd never had bar speed data? And I'm not sure that I would be in a totally different place than where I am now. Um, I, don't think, I don't think having bar speed feedback has, like, been the make or break thing for my training. Um, I think it's helped me be a little bit more precise with my RPE, but I was doing a pretty good job of it to begin with. So I think I, if I can concur with you, Mike. It, yeah, if it speeds up that learning curve, then you know, I think that's really what we're getting okay. after. Yeah. yeah, that's the two biggest aspects I use from technology. It's going to be one like an UberSense, which is a coaching app. You know, it gives me the ability to enhance and, and blow up their movement patterns and give the finite, hey, I'm not externally rotating the femur, you know, in the deepest part of the squat where I should be. So those type of things, it gives me the ability to use that app with that software and also the gym aware to correlate the two, to be able to, again, give them something that they can actually grab a hold to and maybe makes more sense to them um, versus, again, maybe providing them data and then providing them what I think is correct, and then essentially not having something they can take back home with them. Because again, the UberSense is a free app. So the soldiers typically use those everywhere they go. They can you know, put that on their Apple product and they can at least start providing some kind of feedback. Hey, hey Donnie, what level are the uh, soldiers and athletes that you're getting? What, uh, what ability level are you typically getting in there? Typically what we get is uh, a senior uh, NCO so normally a soldier that's already got anywhere from eight to 12 years in the military, they will attend our course or it will be a junior officer. So maybe a first lieutenant up to a captain. Uh, essentially, everybody that's at a company level is the primary target we focus because, again, the end state is to have one personal trainer essentially for every company in the Army that's okay. up to date and is certified and knows what they're doing. But specifically, like what skill level, like people that are completely deconditioned to really experience seasoned, you know, Oh, they're not experienced seasoned when it comes to the exercise science community. Uh, our course is 140 hours. So we do teach them basic uh, skeletal and musculoskeletal uh, anatomy. We teach them basic physiology and kinesiology. But we do have some people that are not educated when they come in, but they walk away with a lot of information and a lot of things in their kit bag that hopefully – they can go back and make an impact immediately at the organization. Right. Donnie, uh, I want to talk a little bit about, about your training, if you don't mind. Um, specifically, when you're training for, for one of these meets, you know, world or national or something like that, where you're about to go uh, lift some big weights. Um, how much of this do you, 
incorporate into your own training? Are you pulling gym aware and, and incorporating that into what you do or what you do fundamentally different than that? Okay. Talk a little bit about my training. It's uh, currently structured. It's ever changing, as you know. Our body acclimates to stimuli more rapidly <laughs> than science wants to reflect. But knowing that, you know, I, I'm constantly uh, pulling NSCA journals. I'm constantly collecting data to implement change. Uh, I base my cycle, you know, pretty much off different modalities, exercise prescription, and different progressions. Uh, so my macro cycle essentially broke down in three or four blocks of mesocycles. And in those three or four blocks, that let's just say it runs from June to June, you know, when you're talking world championship type stuff. Um, I will dedicate the first block. It's going to be more essentially of a deload or a rest uh, from the power of three. So those that four to six week block, I, I really won't touch a squat. I won't touch a deadlift or I won't touch a bench press specifically. Uh, and twofold reason. One is rest. Uh, is very critical and it's a prerequisite of the top three. You talk nutrition timing, you talk uh, activity and your training, and you, you talk uh, recovery. Um, so I, I essentially, like I said, I, I take one rest. That's one main reason for the optimal adaptation. And then secondly, I recruit more motor uh, type 2 motor neurons in my phosphate energy <laughs> system. So I focus on plyometrics. I focus on uh, dynamic movement patterns in the sagittal and phosphate system. I target those for the first four to six weeks after world championship. Gotcha. But that's actually interesting that you say that because we we do something real similar with our guys, especially when they're coming off of a big competition like that, be it nationals or world or something. Um, we'll start them out with, usually we tend to be more on the three week side um, for, we, we call it a restoration block. It's a very similar. Um, you know, little to no uh, practice of the competition lifts. We're mm -hmm. doing a lot of uh, movement patterns that get neglected throughout our normal training. You know, no, in a normal training cycle, you're a lot of times just constrained by resources. So things like rotation work get put on the on the back burner. Unilateral work gets put on the back burner a lot of times, you know, in favor of those things that are going to drive your lifts up a little bit more. So we'll favor that stuff uh, real hard in that, in that first uh, restoration block. So, anyway, and just so you there. know, I, I incorporated this two years ago. Uh, in 2013, I was squatting 435, uh, about 180 pounds, and I've hit 600, you know, within about two years. Uh, and I really am a firm believer that those four to six weeks of taking a break from the bar and really focusing again, like I said, on some of the other peripheral muscles and synergistic and stabilizing muscles that set the conditions for those heavy loads, I think makes a big difference. Going in my block, wait, too, wait, wait, obviously. That's crazy talk, right? So you mean to tell me that taking a few weeks away from the competition list is not going to be on a, a weakness tailspin for the rest of your career? I know. That same thing Mark told me. Mark Rod was like, what, Donnie? What are you doing up there? <laughs> I did my first meet up there with him in uh, South Africa, and we, we sat there and ate some dinner. And uh, I, like I said, I was a, a mid-400 mid squatter and then come back the next year or so, and he's like, Wow. You know, you're almost catching me now. What are, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. Well, we're we're working on Mark too. Uh, he's in the process of getting healthy, and I think I think he'll be yeah uh, having some similar experiences once he gets to where he can put in a, a good training cycle without getting too beat up. But anyway, you, you were kind of going through your annual plan a little bit. Yeah, and then like I said, I roll into my block too. Uh, it's obviously going to be more volume driven. Uh, still going to be a non-linear hypertrophy type program uh, so that I can actually build up some work capacity and allow me to incorporate now some speed type strength training. That's where my demo work really comes from. Uh, I'll tie that pieces in and hold my benchmarks. Uh, and again, I will set my weights based on my bar speed and I will adjust that specific workout again to that. So if I'm not adhered to it, I'm going to either drop it down or move it up. Uh, to ensure that I'm within, you know, two to three tenths of a second of my peak velocity that I'm looking to hit for during that cycle. Um, so again, total volume is going to be pretty high uh, for me. I'm not a big guy like yourself, Mike. I don't, I don't move, you know, thousands of pounds every day. But um, I, I will typically, you know, average anywhere from 60 to 75,000 pounds uh, on my squat and deadlifts, and then normally between uh, 40 and 50,000 pounds uh, on my bench press work just for those weeks in the volume phases. Okay. Are you, when you get into those phases, I'm assuming that the competition lifts are back. 
maybe without an emphasis, maybe they're back, but kind of more on the periphery and you're still doing a bunch of other stuff or is that? That's correct. Right? Still doing a good bit of sits and exercises. Uh, I'm not really focusing on, for example, I'm a low bar squatter, so I won't do hardly any low bar work. Um, I will do more high bar, more front squats. I will do more safety squat bar. I'll do some other exercises so it allows me to build that capacity and I don't put myself in a position, you know, of getting too much work, overreaching too early in the cycle, especially if I'm looking at, you know, maybe a 20 to a 26 week uh, a large uh, meso cycle that I'm working out of. Okay. And about how long is that training block for you? That training block, again, if I'm running, uh, you know, 14 to 20 week type cycle, it could run anywhere from uh, four to six weeks also. Okay. Okay, so they, they seem to be uh, equally sized, at least. Yeah, they're pretty well equal. Um, again, this this coming after the World Championship this year, I had a injury, you know, I told you with my dislocated knee. Um, so I had to kind of stay in more of a, my deload type cycle a little longer than I wanted to, um, but it was essential for me to be able to still be competitive on, in, at the Raw Nationals. That's it. Where do um, where do most of your the volume work you get in in that second block? Where do most of the uh, percentages stay around? Would you say? I'd say most of my typical percentages during that was going to flow between uh, sixty seven and about seventy eight percent. Sounds about right to me. <laughs> That's about the window I'll stay in. Uh, and again, I will throw in some AMRAP cycles in there to give me an opportunity to kind of see how well I'm moving the bar. And a little bit higher rep scheme. Yeah, I mean you're a power lifter, right? You gotta, you gotta right. push against something now and then. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Most definitely. Yeah. Well. Um, yeah. So the, again, similar. Um, one thing that we've been doing lately, and, and like you said at the beginning, this is all just kind of what what we're doing now, right? Because it's a, always a constant uh, bit of evolution. But we're, what we've been doing lately is after that restoration block, we'll hit a, a hypertrophy training block that's, again, pretty short. Um, but it's more about setting us up for hypertrophy gains because also, like you mentioned, um, I got a reputation, I guess, for being a pretty high volume uh, coach. I tend to throw a lot of volume at our guys. So um, when they get back into those loading blocks, you know, I mean, there's plenty of volume there for hypertrophy. Um, so for, for now, for lately, uh, we've been shifting those strategies around more or less as needed. Um, we'll monitor the training for our athletes, you know, and as long as they're progressing how we want them to progress, we'll stick with a strategy. But then, uh, when that progress tapers off, uh, which varies quite a bit from lifter to lifter, uh, we'll rotate to a different strategy. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. So I'm guessing then when you hit your uh, your third block uh, and you're getting ready to peak for a competition, it's probably more competition oriented and higher intensity. Most definitely. Uh, the only the only part I forgot to kind of touch base is on my block two. I typically squat about three days a week, uh, bench three days a week, and then I typically do deadlift uh, movement pattern twice a week uh, during that hypertrophy phase. See, so you're you're a high frequency guy too. So, you know, add another another world champion to the, to the list of high frequency people. <laughs> you feel better now, Mike? <laughs> I feel feel validated. <laughs> yeah. But no, my block three is like you said, it's gonna mirror that. I'm gonna allow myself now to get up there and touch a little bit of heavy work, start to get my CNS involved, um, to allow me to have the ability to set the conditions, obviously, to, to hit the platform. Um, that can be that uh, cycle can run. I've sometimes done a split of uh, a little bit of intensity and a little bit of peaking uh, with those, so I split it up. I might do a six week and three week of be intensity and three weeks of be peaking. It'd be just depending on how much time I have available, you know, going into that block. Um, I do like to give myself an opportunity uh, to always be able to touch, you know, some 90 to 93 percent type work. Uh, in the gym and to try to do those for multiple singles uh, to give me an opportunity to, to really know exactly where my temp selections are when I get a little bit closer to the platform. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
Where would, um, what are some, some things that you've kind of done to develop your training over the course of your career so far? And, and what are some things that didn't work that you've had to adjust? Well, I tell you, um, you know, we all kind of come from mindset of a linear type program because it's all based on novice athletes, you know, beginners. And, uh, I would venture to say that I probably spent too much time in a linear, uh, mindset and allow things to kind of flow too much and not allow myself to have continuous stimuli to change. So I think during the last 15, 20 years, I had some times where I was stagnant and I go back and look at some of those times. And those were times where I just really didn't uh, add adaptation. I didn't add variety to my lifts. I didn't add some uh, challenges within the specific session to ensure that I could uh, promote change and promote that DOMS. You know, you gotta have that muscle soreness in a good way uh, to be able to allow you to continue to progress. Paul, you see similar stuff as far as people sticking with linear progression too long or not doing enough to continue uh, stimulating new progress, right? I do. I'm, I'm wrestling with that constantly, deciding on, on what, on how long we want linear to, to go, if at all. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll start a brand new novice lifter on linear just for a couple weeks or, or, probably at most maybe six weeks just to get them used to the movement pattern. But, but my inclination lately has been to move them off of linear as quickly as possible. Just to, as, as Donnie was saying, just to get that stimulation going. Cause then, then, then people fall asleep linear. I, I think linear has a way of just putting you to sleep and gets you complacent. You can go up a little bit. You can repeat. It's just, there's, there's, I, I like the stimulation of kind of changing it up and getting them something uh, more intermediate quickly especially when they're in, in a situation like, like my gym or say, you know, where Donnie is or where, where we can watch them and we, we can help linear linear is a good way to keep people very, very quiet and complacent, I believe. But, but when we can watch and we can push where necessary, we help kind of become part of that auto regulation. Yeah. They can be a little bit more aggressive and, and I mean, especially you've got a, a newer lifter who conceivably is making progress at a good rate. You know, then yeah, let's let's take advantage of what's there. You know, that's a, a prime time for auto regulation as a concept to be a role in somebody's training. Maybe they're not using RPE just because they don't have the experience background to do it. But that doesn't mean that we can't take what's there, especially like what you were saying, if you've got an experienced coach or, or some sort of system in place to help facilitate, you know, their their lack of experience. Yeah, I think it's I think I think it's the way to go. I think I think if if anybody wants to make progress, they that's the best. That's the fastest way to go because people get lost in linear. Oh, I concur, just like with, um, with Paul and Mike said. It just again, I think it goes back to ensuring that you know they have the proper movement patterns. Uh, if if they're having any kind of shortcomings in those, I think it, the linear does allow them to be able to correct them uh, more efficiently. Uh, in a shorter time, which allows the client or that athlete to move in the right direction so that now they can have more adaptation and more stimuli to promote that. Yeah, and, uh, it's one episode. So uh, we're going to call it a day there. And uh, when we come back, uh, we'll have part two of our interview with Donnie Bingham. We'll talk about some more stuff, uh, auto regulation related, uh, about his work with the Army, about his training, injuries, uh, sports psychology and all kinds of stuff. So uh, make sure that you check back with us next week and uh, we'll have the part two of this uh, interview up and posted. Uh, in the meantime, we did just release a huge chunk of video content. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more, uh, this is all content uh, straight from RTS Classroom. We've got uh, video packs from myself, um, from Dr. Mike Zordos, from Ben Escrow, uh, Dr. Mike T. Nelson, we cover stuff like heart rate variability. We cover nutrition, uh, periodization concepts, uh, applied sports science, and, and so on and so on. So uh, head over to the classroom and look at classroom video downloads and see if any of that stuff interests you. Uh, as always, thank you uh, for checking that out. Thanks for supporting the podcast. Uh, with that, uh, good luck with your training this week. And as always, uh, take what's there and build some momentum. See you guys next time.